Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for uh, joining me, especially on, on such a nice day out. Um, really appreciate uh, you uh, tuning in here. Um, this is this is, is the uh, first webinar I've done, so uh, I think this will be uh, kind of interesting. I, I was just thinking about um, when I was a, a little kid. I used to um, I used to announce uh, these imaginary baseball games, and I uh, I would be sitting there talking in my bedroom to my hairbrush. Uh, making up these uh, baseball games. And I think at the time I thought I was practicing to, to uh, someday become a uh, broadcast announcer, but now I realize that uh, 40 years ago, I was actually trained to, uh, to uh, do my first webinar. Uh, so with that, uh, this, this is the uh, seventh annual uh, top 10 list uh, that we've done. And the um, way that uh, this got uh, started was, um, uh, uh, several years ago, I, I was asked uh, to uh, be on a, uh, a uh, breakfast uh, panel that uh, started at 7 a.m. in the morning um, in January. It was like about minus five out. And uh, anyway, the, the other uh, folks on, on the panel, uh, one was an economist, um, one was a uh, housing expert, and another guy was a office and industrial real estate expert, and I, I was expected to uh, handle retail. Well, those guys, uh, they, they all had uh, staffs and had lots of statistics uh, that, they had, um, that their firms had uh, collected, whereas I just pretty much just had myself. Didn't want to get up there and just, you know, read off somebody else's retail uh, real estate statistics. I knew, knew where to find them, but, uh, you know, it wasn't really my original research. So came up with the uh, top 10 list to, to kind of uh, compensate for that. And um, also, I just wanted to add maybe a little bit of uh, excitement to the 7 a.m. breakfast. I you know it's kind of weird for a guy named Boring to be the guy to, uh, to lighten up things. But uh, anyway, the uh, material was kind of dry, and uh, um, they uh, enjoyed my top ten list. So I, I've uh, uh, kept doing it ever since. We don't have the breakfast anymore. Uh, it kind of went away during the uh, recession. But I, I still do a top ten list every year, and I, I'll end up um, – using this list uh, 10 or 15 times throughout the year. Uh, I'll, I'll give it to uh, various groups. I'll take parts of it and use it in some of my reports. I'll talk to Main Street groups uh, about these trends. So I really do get a lot of use out of the list. Um, also, uh, the, the media um, usually covers it. I've already uh, done three interviews um, this month, or I guess last month, uh, about the list. And, uh, and and just it just kind of helps uh, Deb and I keep up with what the uh, trends are. So uh, just a couple of ground rules. Um, uh, we don't try to cover every trend every year. Uh, it really would be kind of impossible to do. So there might be something here that, uh, that you thought would, would be a big trend, but maybe I covered it last year or the year before. Um, the, the only things that we try to be consistent on is we always start off with looking at the economy, especially consumer confidence, because it's so important um, for retail. And then we look at uh, local retail uh, real estate stats and major new projects that are in the pipeline. Always do one page on Walmart because um, you know whether you love them or hate them, you you really have to uh, you really have to keep up with them because they're always on the leading edge. Um, and then we do the what's hot, what's not uh, zingers. And th those are actually take more time for me to write, I think, than the rest of the presentation. But people seem to like those. So I, I keep doing them here. Yep. Okay. So with that, we'll get started. And this is a countdown. Uh, let's start off with number 10. Um, fatigue sets in. Consumers spend away their blues in, in spite of the economic uncertainty. This year was, this year, particularly during the holiday season, was kind of bizarre from my standpoint because the one thing I usually look at to predict um, consumer spending is consumer confidence. And this year it was awfully low. It was uh, at 56 uh, during the month of November. It, I, I, I saw something that actually increased up to 64 in December, but when I was writing this, it was only 56. Yet, you just had the feeling that people were, I called it fatigue fatigue. That they were tar tired of just feeling down and out, and they were ready to go out and just uh, splurge a little bit. And, in fact, um, uh, I've read some statistics that show that uh, what I'm calling self-gifting, where, you know, you say, where the dad says, you know what the family really needs? We need a big screen TV. And, of course, you know, 
course, he's going to be the one sitting there watching it, watching the football games on it. But uh, there's a lot of examples of self-gifting. Anyway, the, the self-gifting was up 16% um, during the holiday season last year. Uh, people sent, spent 16% more dollars uh, on themselves while they were out shopping. Another thing, uh, holiday decorating. Nobody really needs holiday decorations. I mean, if if uh, you know if you're, if you're living from paycheck to paycheck or whatever, um, holiday decorating was up eight percent. So th those are little signs to me that, that the consumer, even if they don't really have the money, they're they're ready to spend again. And in fact, uh, one of the results of the recession was that savings rates had, had gone back up to seven percent, but now they're back down to four percent. Uh, it's a lot better though than when before we went into the recession, it was less than 1% uh, of, uh, of, of uh, paychecks that people were uh, putting into savings. Another thing, um, um, in, in looking at the economy from a retail standpoint, is uh, there's a lot of difference between the affluent uh, shoppers and the uh, not-so-affluent shoppers. Um, because uh, stocks and uh, corporate profits uh, have risen much faster than wages and, and government assistance over the last two years, the, the higher end of the market has come back. And it really, it, you really couldn't call it a recession anymore, I think, for, um, for households that are earning uh, at least $70,000 a year or more. Uh, and that was reflected in uh, luxury retailers, their sales. Uh, it'd be retailers like Saks and Neiman Marcus. Meanwhile, uh, Walmart had a, a very difficult year. And in fact, uh, they're, they're, and that's because their customers were having a difficult year. And they, in fact, brought uh, back their uh, layaway program. We'll talk a little bit more about Walmart here in a minute. <clears throat> so when you, when you have unemployment so stubbornly high, and you know, I've seen reports where uh, there's six people lined up for every job out there that's available. I guess that, uh, unless it's a real high tech job that you have to have the proper training for. But uh, anyway, my point about that is, I, I think as we're coming out of this recession, larger companies and even smaller companies, uh, for that matter, they're, they're focusing their spending on technology and equipment, not necessarily on going out and hiring people, and not necessarily on training. I, I saw uh, an article where one guy was quoted, and he, he said, "Well, you know, wh when I when I buy a new software program, I don't have to spend any time on training it. it, it it's ready to go from from day one. And uh, right or wrong, I, I I think that that's kind of the attitude out there. Um, I don't think that we're it's so much that we're shipping jobs overseas as uh, technology is is uh, eating into um, eating into the jobs and." That includes retail. I, I think people think of uh, technology as impacting more manufacturing, but there have been a number of um, technological innovations that have impacted uh, retail pro productivity, which is uh, rising at a rate of about 2% um, uh, each year during this decade when you take out inflation. So what's happening? People are, are starting to, to start their own companies. And um, I, I just looked at this for Central Ohio, but... Um, found that uh, uh, out of the 900,000 employees here, here in central Ohio, about 10% of them are uh, considered to be self-employed. In fact, uh, uh, new business starts were up 5% across the state last year. So I, I think a lot of people are saying, instead of uh, you know turning my wheels, trying to find a job, I'm going to uh, try to start a company. <clears throat> okay, th this one's uh, a little bit more oriented towards uh, central Ohio. But um, I, I suspect if I did the research, I'd find the same thing uh, in some of the other major markets throughout Ohio. In central Ohio, we now have 56 million square feet of shopping center space. And my question is, do we really need that much? And did we ever need that much? And, and, and I guess most importantly, will we need this much in the future? Um, this is something I, I used to talk about all the time in the media, and I just kind of got tired of it. And uh, I haven't revisited this topic <clears throat> excuse me, uh, for a while, but um, shopping center uh, square feet per capita, it was only 12 in 1980 in central Ohio. That grew to 18 in 1990, 24 in 2000. That means 24 square feet of shopping sp center space for every man, woman, and child in central Ohio. And by 2010, it had grown to 31. So does anybody notice a pattern out there? 
I, I was kind of amazed at how it, how it uh, broke off so evenly in you know in uh, units of six until you get to 2010 and it actually bumped up to seven seven more that year. Uh, that's just an amazing statistic to me. And if we continue at that pace here in Central Ohio, it would mean that we would have to add another 16 million square feet of shopping center space uh, by 2020. And just to you know, kind of demonstrate what that might mean is it, it would be the equivalent of 10 Polaris fashion places. I just don't see how we could possibly support that in this market, but I, I've said that before. Uh, uh, the retail vacancy rate uh, is still in the double digits, it's still around 10 or 11 percent, um, which is a little bit above the national average. This last statistic, though, I think is, is the real key. And that is that uh, year after year after year, e-commerce keeps adding more and more growth. Uh, even in kind of an off year, uh, last year, it, it was a, up another 15 percent. And uh, Albert Einstein once said that the most powerful force in the universe is that of compound interest. I just wonder what um, what uh, Dr. Einstein would think about uh, e-commerce because, uh, you know, sooner or later, it's going to overtake uh, in-store retailing. In fact, I, I kind of did a, a, a projection if it, if it continued at the same pace that it would take overtake um, store retail sales sometime in the, in the mid-2030s. So we're not quite there yet, but... Uh, Anyway, my point is, I, I just don't think that, I, I think we might need more warehouse space, but not more retail space. And some of that retail space is in the wrong places. It, I mean, I, I still think we need to redevelop, uh, particularly um, uh, in, in more urban areas. But uh, the total amount of space, I, I just think that we've uh, topped out on that. Um, here locally, we, we have a, um, a developer called uh, Wagonbrenner. Uh, was my uh, my first landlord uh, uh, when I uh, opened my business, and uh, they, they've done they're they're just doing uh, some great work here in Columbus. Seems like every time you you look at a, a property that has you know brownfields issues or in in some cases uh, you know financial issues, wagon burner has stepped in and uh, and is stepping up to the plate and taking on these uh, difficult projects. As you can see them listed out there, uh, Wineland Park, Kaplan, Columbus Coated Fabrics, Tempkin, et cetera. So uh, kudos to them. What, what else is happening in Central Ohio? Um, this was a major coup for our downtown, uh, which I think is the most underserved market in, in Central Ohio. They're going to get a, a Hills uh, grocery store uh, supermarket, kind of an upscale gourmet uh, supermarket, I'm very bullish on their location. They're right next to um, right next to CCAD, but in fact, that, that whole Grant Avenue corridor has something like 35,000 college students. Uh, if you add the, the, the six different little colleges together, it's really the equivalent of a, of a Big Ten university. Uh, plus, you have uh, all kinds of new housing going in uh, next to the area, not to mention uh, the, the uh, office market. So I'm very bullish about that uh, project. Um, Something else you might have been uh, reading about, it, uh, I'm sure, is, uh, are the uh, four casinos. Uh, the one in Columbus is uh, expected to open uh, sometime, I think, next fall. Uh, it, it was kind of sold, I think, to the citizens here that uh, it, it would uh, provide a, a big boost uh, for the west side, which has a, ha has a lot of vacant retail space. I guess I'm not seeing that. Uh, I, I, I see people driving to the casino. Uh, probably eating at the casino, gambling at the casino, and leaving. So I, I think the impact is really going to be pretty limited. I, I think, you know, you, you'll be able to support uh, gasoline stations and convenience stores and maybe four or five uh, sit-down restaurants. But um, I, I guess I'm also uh, uh, putting that on, on the idea that right now it's just a casino. Now, if they develop other attractions in that area, that, that can make a, a big difference. Uh, another project that's going on uh, up in the Del Delaware area is that they're trying to um, um, uh, widen the uh, 3637 interchange. It's a uh, real bottleneck right now, and uh, several retailer, re retail developers uh, have plans for that if they can ever get, get the uh, traffic situation fixed there. But I've heard rumors that uh, Cabela's could be going there, uh, Bass Pro Shop, possibly even Ikea, some of the the big uh, destination retailers that uh, 
that need a lot of space and need that um, that interstate exposure, uh, we could see them going there in, in the future. Okay, number eight, um, Left for Dead. Um, this was kind of the last one to make the cut this year in terms of my list. And I just thought, you know, it, it'd be kind of fun to go back and look at the at the regional mall because, it, it, you know, if you read the literature, it, people have kind of, as I say here, have left it for dead. Uh, you know, it's, it's almost, this is almost the, the uh, untrend uh, because malls are not trendy. But um, in my research, what I found was that uh, we've actually had 15 malls close in, in Ohio over, over the last uh, 30 years. And I think part of that is because um, Ohio, um, it's kind of like, it, these guys are kind of like the Wright brothers uh, of the retail industry. We had a lot of the pioneers, uh, particularly up in Northeast Ohio, with Cafaro, uh, DeBartolo, Jacobs. Then here in Columbus area, we had Glumster. They were the early mall pioneers, and uh, that, it was good and bad. Uh, uh, the good part is that you know Ohio was was um, was an uh, innovator in a lot of uh, a lot of uh, retail ventures. The bad part is because they built these malls so early, they've become very old and um, obsolete in many cases. They've been overtaken by the newer uh, power centers, easier to shop lifestyle centers. Uh, based on um, Based on an analysis, I, I read this from uh, a guy with Kafaro. Um, he was predicting that another nine or ten of um, Ohio's remaining malls uh, could close this decade. So that's kind of the bad news. The good news is those that survive are stronger than ever. I mean, they, they still have a lot of the retail fundamentals. They still have the best locations. They have the critical mass, especially for fashion. They provide a relaxed social family experience. Uh, it's not like the, the strip centers where, you, you know, it's in and out. Uh, you can, you know, take your family to the mall and uh, still have a, a very relaxing, pleasant experience. Um, another thing that malls have done is they, they're not so restricted to their old formula of, of department stores and specialty stores. Uh, they, they've brought in uh, category killers like sporting goods stores. They've um, a, a couple of malls have uh, brought in upscale warehouse clubs like Costco. Uh, you can find fine dining restaurants. You don't have to eat the food court anymore in a lot of malls. Uh, some have even uh, accepted discount department stores like Walmart and Target. And uh, pop-up shops are becoming more common in malls uh, because they do have uh, a lot of excess space to fill. So uh, mall sales were actually up a little bit more than um, – than sales were for all, all of retail in 2011, which kind of surprised me a little. Uh, because uh, a lot of these malls do have excess space, the, the stronger specialty retailers are uh, going in and taking over those spaces. Uh, two best examples would be Forever 21 and Victoria's Secret. Victoria's Secret uh, intrigues me because they, they increased their, their footprint by 55% um, last year or maybe a couple of years ago. And they were doing $700 a square foot. So you would think if they added all that space, their sales per square foot might go down. What well, it hasn't. They're still doing over 700 And um, I, I, I was listening to some shopping center guys talk one day. And uh, that's kind of their litmus test. Uh, where, you know, you hear the term A mall, B mall, C mall. Uh, a malls are the ones that have Victoria's Secret. And Victoria's Secret could open a lot more locations if they want to. But they're pretty choosy about where where they choose to locate. <clears throat> I think uh, Devin's uh, being arrested or something, if you hear the, hear the sirens in the background. <laughs> okay. All okay, right, here, here's the Walmart slide. I promised you we would do one on Walmart. Uh, Walmart shrugged. Uh, it, you know, it, it's funny. I, I, I've been following Walmart and Target um, for a long time now. And it seems like to me when... Either one of them has a bad year, and by the way, both of them kind of had a bad year this past year. Is is because they're they're trying to be the, the other guy. In this case, uh, Walmart um, they they uh, had a lot of shoppers uh, during the recession that were a little bit more affluent than their their no, their normal uh, customer base. So they they started to go just a little upscale to to try to hold on to those customers. 
And now the, the word is out that Walmart isn't necessarily the lowest prices anymore, which is almost, you know, kind of blasphemous. But um, I know from talking to, to people like my mother that are shopaholics that, uh, that, that that's kind of the, the impression right now is that you, you, if you want the lowest prices, it's not, not necessarily Walmart. Um, and who's kind of stepped in, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that, is uh, the dollar stores, especially if they've gained market share at the expense of, of Target and Walmart. Um, and I mentioned Target. I wanted to uh, uh, also uh, hit on that point about the reason why I think they didn't have a good year this past year. They invested something like $500 million into expanding their, their grocery sections in, in their stores. And apparently, and, and again, in a bid to be more like Walmart, and apparently uh, it's not working out very well. Um, people are not going to Target to do their major grocery shopping like they do at Walmart. I know myself when I go to Target, I, I'll buy a few things just on impulse in the grocery section, but it's just not where I go to do my, my grocery shopping. And I, I think it's hard to get people out of that mentality. Um, one thing that Walmart is doing this year, to, and Target, by the way, um, to fight back against these uh, dollar stores, they're opening their own dollar stores. Uh, Walmart is uh, called Walmart Express, and uh, they, they uh, test piloted it in uh, Arkansas last year. They're getting ready to roll it out. Target has one called City Target that, that they're getting ready to roll out. Um, these are miniature versions of, of their full line stores. They carry about 10% of the amount of uh, merchandise that a, um, a full line Walmart or Target would. Uh, Walmart is also uh, trying to catch up on the uh, technology end, and uh, they've been invested heavily into online um, digital movies and also social networking. They had something called uh, Shoppy Cat uh, that they rolled out last year that. Um, I guess it hooks in with uh, Facebook, and it, it um, suggests gifts for people that uh, are your Facebook friends based on their interest. I don't know how well that really works, but uh, interesting idea. Uh, I could probably put this, la this next point in here every year. Uh, it's the, the thorn in Walmart's side are, are labor problems. They, uh, they, they just constantly get sued over what their labor practices and they're probably the most um, anti-union uh, company on earth. Uh, there was a, actually a, a store in Canada that tried to uh, tried to unionize. They closed the whole store just to, to keep out the union. So um, anyway, uh, here uh, in central Ohio, uh, we went through a pretty bruising battle last year uh, in Walmart or excuse me, in Westerville over Walmart, who uh, wanted to locate in a just a, a, a terrible center. I, I looked at this center about 10 years ago and couldn't think of, you know, what to do with it. It, uh, it used to have a, um, used to have a Lazarus and a, and a Big Bear and a Hancock Fabrics. And, you know, all three of those were, were gone. So basically you had a center sitting there at it, one of the prime intersections of Westerville that was 75%, uh, 80% vacant. So anyway, uh, the uh, developer, George Hadler, I, I have to hand it to him, his tenaciousness, uh, he actually got Walmart interested in, in that site, which I, I never would have thought Walmart would uh, go for a site like that, but um, it, apparently it's a location that they, that, uh, that they really want. So anyway, he, he fought with the city and... Uh, he won, uh, basically. So Walmart will be going into Westerville. Um, it seems like I, I kind of get in the middle of, the, uh, of these things a lot of times, and uh, I try to be objective. Uh, some of the potential benefits are more choices and lower prices uh, for the consumer, jobs and taxes for the city. I uh, saw something where it's going to add uh, something like $700,000 uh, a year uh, uh, for Westerville uh, for their tax base. Potential negatives, uh, traffic congestion is already a very congested uh, corner that, uh, that they're going to be located on. And cannibalization of, of expenditures at existing retailers. Um, Westerville has one of the, the, the best uh, downtowns, I, I think, in the whole state. And uh, Walmart will be less than, a, well, I say about a mile uh, away from their, they call it uptown. Um, however, uh, 
I think I've uh, learned in my work with, with Deb Miller and the Retail as Detail program that there are a lot of ways that uh, independents can thrive, e even with Walmart uh, nearby. And uh, I guess I'll save that for another time, but uh, it can be done. Okay, um, next, uh, good, good stuff cheap. Um, this is actually um, Ollie's uh, uh, slogan, Ollie's bargain outlet. The wheel of retailing turns again. This, the, the wheel of retailing was something I, I learned about um, in my very early days as, as a uh, retail consultant. It's kind of passed down to me. And at the time, they, they were talking about um, how Walmart and Target had come in and undercut the original department stores, uh, you know, like, like Lazarus, like Macy's, et cetera. And I got to thinking about it, and I think that that wheel has turned again because uh, now you have the, the dollar stores and the closeout stores that have kind of come in and undercut uh, Walmart and Target. That you know, what what happens is they in, inevitably expand and upgrade their offer, and that leaves room for somebody to come in under them. So uh, I, I actually looked up the uh, statistics, and I was really kind of surprised at this. 35 to 40 net new dollar and closeout stores have opened in, um, per year uh, in the state of Ohio since 2000. Discount department stores, 9 or 10 have closed per year in Ohio. We actually have the third most uh, dollar stores in, in the whole uh, country. Um, and the, the other thing about dollar stores is they love to locate right next to Walmart or Target. Uh, they're often in uh, uh, older, uh, lower rent uh, strips. <clears throat> okay, um, <clears throat> so where, where, do, where do they get their merchandise? Uh, I'm not going to read this whole laundry list here, but I, I did think that was interesting. Uh, uh, and I, I, you know, I, I, I chose to uh, focus on Ollie's, but I'm, I'm sure you know Big Lots and the rest of them are, uh, have the same types of sources. You know, one thing I, 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 I have found out since I wrote this is that uh, because the dollar stores are doing so well, manufacturers like Procter & Gamble are, are actually um, producing uh, uh, special uh, package sizes for dollar stores, uh, particularly on the food side, because if, I, I think food really drives the traffic to, to these stores. So they have to have uh, a, a little bit more consistent um, uh, supply on, on the food side. But... Um, I just find it interesting, though, that they're, they're starting to, to uh, have the same uh, uh, amenity creep uh, maybe that the, these other ones did. They're not truly 100%, uh, you know, all these things that you, you see listed in, in, the, uh, in the green box in the middle of the page there. Um, what makes the, the, the dollar store work? I, I think it's the treasure hunt aspect. Um, Customers spend only, only 10 minutes in the stores, so you have to keep things changing constantly. It, it's, they, they go in there just to, you know, to, to see what's on sale this week or see what the big deal is this week. Another little advantage that they have is also is that they, is that they sell the smaller uh, package sizes. Uh, the thing about Walmart or Target, if you, if you have a small household, yeah, you could probably save, you know, like if you – I don't know, bought, you know, 40 rolls of paper towels at once. But, uh, you know, that's just not really practical for, for smaller households. Um, the other thing, the other uh, elements to their business model, of course, are uh, cheap labor, uh, pretty much paid minimum wage. And they're only 10,000 square feet in terms of uh, store size. So it also keeps the, um, keeps the sales down or um, uh, keeps the cost down, rather. Um the thing that's happened this year that's uh, kind of interesting um, with the dollar stores is, is they're starting to attract a lot of the more affluent uh, consumers. In fact, that, that the segment um, earning seventy thousand dollars or more shopped those three, uh, the top three dollar stores, twice as much in twenty eleven than they did five years ago. That's uh, according to Nielsen Research. Um, I think part of it, you know. Um, I think part of being a, a retail analyst is keeping up with pop culture. And in this case, I, you know, if you look at some of these uh, reality uh, TV programs, they're, they're, a lot of them are, you know, centered around 
uh, this uh, bargain hunting mentality, things like storage wars, uh, uh, pawn stars, um, etc. Uh, another trend uh, in recent years has been uh, goodwill. Goodwill has had they're, they're doing something like twenty percent growth a year. They, they, they've just been going great guns ever since the uh, recession began. And in fact, now they're starting to open up upscale thrift shops. Um, they just opened one um, in, in Dublin last year, which is a kind of an affluent suburb of, of uh, Columbus. So, so we have the, the, the dollar stores versus the uh, discount stores. Okay, now we're ready to get into uh, some lifestyle trends. Um, I, um, I wrote this one last year, uh, pretty much on the same topics, and I, I thought, geez, you know, these topics are still pretty relevant for for 2012. So I just kind of did an update on on these uh, three topics. Um, the first one, uh, the life of Riley, uh, ongoing humanization of pets, gives way to boomer style indulgences. Uh, gosh, you know, I I I, I uh, collect articles. Um, all year long and, uh, you know, to, to do this list at the end of the year. And probably my thickest folder is the one on, on pets. Uh, it seems like every day you pick up the newspaper and there's something else that people are doing that is just kind of crazy. You know, that, uh, that, you know, they're treating their, their pets better than, um, a lot of human beings are, are treated, I guess. I, anyway, uh, my, my partner, Doug, um, uh, she's a good example of this because uh, her her uh, her daughter is a sophomore at uh, at Ohio State now, and um, she and her husband went out and got a dog uh, after the daughter left. And that that really is driving a lot of this is uh, empty nesters. Um, after the last child leaves, they they go out and get a dog or a cat, and they treat it as a, a, a surrogate uh, child. So she was telling me about this uh, doggy day camp that. Uh, that her dog, he had to apply to it. He, you know, they didn't just accept any dog. <laughs> it's, it's like uh, like some of these kindergartens I've read about. Uh, Human-grade uh, pet foods. Uh, people are actually cooking meals for their dogs. Uh, again, my partner, Deb, she, she has a Martha Stewart dog do bag. I couldn't believe it when she told me that. Um, but anyway, this is a $55 billion a year industry. Um, and I think it was like about 45 billion, maybe three or, three or four years ago. So it's still going right up the roof. Um, and the incidence of uh, pet ownership actually increases with household income. I found that interesting. I think the desk was kind of playing into this kind of overindulgence um, is because, you know, people that own pets uh, have more income. Uh, and it's also reflected in more uh, vet visits. Uh, pets live longer, uh, eat better, and... Um, uh, or have the benefits of modern medicine, just like uh, human beings do. Okay, you may have uh, heard of this company uh, called uh, Facebook. Um, in fact, uh, I think they may have did their IPO today. They were talking, they were rumoring, it, there was a rumor that they, that they might um, actually uh, do that uh, today. I, I haven't seen the news yet. But uh, it, it's going to be a huge uh, initial pu public offering, uh, $10 billion. Uh, one, of the, one of the largest ever. Um, we're uh, big advocate, advocates of uh, Facebook ads um, because we, we feel like, um, especially for small retailers and in, in, uh, in the Main Street programs, uh, because they're affordable, uh, you, you can be more precise in, um, in targeting your market, and you can also measure your, your results a little bit uh, a little bit better than you can with uh, traditional media. So we've been uh, we've been recommending uh, Facebook, at least Facebook uh, pages to all the retailers, but also even considering Facebook ads. And in fact, uh, Facebook ads uh, ad revenue doubled from two billion to four billion last year. Expected to hit six point five billion this year. One reason I think that uh, social media is 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 effective for retailers. If you look at online purchases, females versus males, it's 58% female, 42% males. Happens to be the, the same ratio for social media usage. So social media is a good way to meet 
to, to reach that female customer. Um, another uh, thing that uh, has been in the news quite a bit lately is uh, Google Plus. They're, this is kind of like their answer to uh, to Facebook. And from what I've been reading, it's really coming down to, to a big uh, a big rivalry uh, between Google and Facebook. They're going to be kind of the, the big two um, going forward. But they, they have their own version. They, they expect to hit 400 million users by 2012. I put users in quotation marks because... I'm not really sure how they're defining users. If you know, if if, if you just sign up for it, are you a user uh, versus people that you know are are on Facebook? I forget how many hours a week the average person is on anymore, but it's like ten or fifteen. Um, and then um, the the next topic is the the great Groupon debate. And I I have to admit I, I'm kind of skeptical about this, but. As I read more about it, I, I do think that, you know, I, I say, is it in its infancy or rapidly reaching maturity? I probably would have said ra rapidly reaching maturity until I uh, went in and did some research. And they still have a lot of, uh, of, a lot of territory that they, they have not touched yet. So um, I, I, think, I think you're going to see more, more Groupon rather than less. It's not going to go away. The idea of Groupon, of course, is, okay, Mr. Merchant, you're, you're going to take a financial hit on this one deal, but hopefully you're going to get some uh, loyal repeat customers. Well, the actual statistics show that 38% of the, the, the people that use Groupons were already coming to your business, already loved it, so you probably just lost money on them. 27%, um, there are people that come to your business sometimes, they're just not, they're not regulars. And I think that those are, are probably worthwhile uh, taking the financial hit. And definitely the 31% new customers. I mean, that's, that's what you're after. Um, interestingly, uh, daily deals, um, they, they uh, quadrupled in 2011. Uh, but the, the number of daily deal sites dwindled from 530 to 360. And I don't know what percentage of, uh, of that market Groupon owns, but I get to think it's a pretty high percentage. Uh, one thing that makes me a little bit bullish about the future of Groupon is so far it's mainly been small businesses that have taken advantage of this. But now some of the chains are starting to, to show interest. Um, I know uh, I, I, I used one for Old Navy recently. So I, I think you're going to see more of the, um, the retail chains using Groupon. They're also getting into the travel market, the direct from uh, manufacturer and the supermarket channels. So that, that'll be interesting to watch. Okay, now now we're up to uh, sector spotlight. What's hot and what's not? Okay, what's hot? Um, sea salt French fries. Burger King Wendy's, they respond to the better burgers trend with better fries. I wonder why they didn't just respond to it with better burgers, but <laughs> I, I guess maybe they're trying. Okay. okay, but what's not? Pepper spray in your eyes. The new Thanksgiving tradition initiated at Walmart during the Midnight Madness sales. That's something else that uh, bugs me a little bit is uh, it, uh, several retailers um, opening on Thanksgiving Day this year, which is great for consumers. But you know, what about the employees? That they have to work on on that holiday. You know, what, what's next? Are they going to start opening on Christmas? All right, enough enough of my ranting. Uh, Okay, what's hot? Lightweight angels. Strangers flock to the local stores to help out the needy. What's not? Generic white skinny prototypes. Push. Uh, uh, these are head, headless mannequins. Sorry, I kind of blew that. Uh, anyway, th they've been pushed aside for highly customized, realistic models. Uh, I was reading about uh, one of the chains that they're spending a million dollars this year on new mannequins. <laughs> um, one other thing about the, the layaway angels, I was reading about a case here in Columbus um, at a local Kmart store where some of the employees um, uh, chipped in to, to help out with, with the, the layaway goods. And then the day after uh, Christmas, uh, Sears announced that they were closing the store and all those people lost their jobs. I guess it wasn't very funny, but anyway, ironic. Um, okay, what's hot? Uh, men, men who enjoy shopping. Uh, men's apparel was actually up 7% last year versus only 1% for women's apparel. Um, also, uh, I've been reading about, and this kind of ties into the next one, uh, what's not men who enjoy working, the man session, 
has resulted into more Mr. Moms. And uh, the recession has kind of hit uh, men a little bit harder. Uh, industries that uh, are kind of dominated by males, at least traditionally, like construction and manufacturing, have been kind of hit the worst. And I was reading about um, the grocery stores are seeing a lot more men in the aisles now. And they were talking about how men are such terrible shoppers or unorganized. And they, they, they've had to um, rearrange the, the store a little bit to, to make it uh, appeal a little bit more to men. Um, what's hot? Shopping online while drinking. Uh, this was a kind of a funny story that came out uh, around Christmas that uh, supposedly, uh, some of the online, online women's fashion sites were uh, uh, reporting these mysterious sell, uh, sales spikes, at, you know, after 8 or 9 p.m. And they, they think it's from women um, sitting there at home, uh, maybe enjoying a glass of wine after, after dinner. And told one, one, they told one story about this one lady that uh, she goes out and looks in the mailbox and there's a... Uh, uh, a, like a cat shaped um, phone holder and I don't know how to describe it. She's like, what's this? And she, she couldn't even remember ordering it, but uh, it's like surprise. Um, anyway, uh, what's not cupcake backlash. Uh, that's kind of been the, the hot, the hot trend for the last couple of years. Apparently kind of wore off last year. Um, consumption was down 18%. I think pies are the new cupcakes. Um, what's hot gourmet burger delivery. This sounds like an interesting idea, and, and uh, you know the guy that started Domino's, so I, I think it has, uh, you know, I, I think it has some merit. Um, uh, he wants to start a burger delivery business, uh, two burger minimum, which you think about it, you know, probably uh, two gourmet burgers would be the equivalent, uh, you know, the same price as a pizza. So I think it makes some sense. Um, what's not? Uh, one thing you used to be able to depend on being delivered to your house was mail. Well, uh, they're, they're going to end uh, Saturday delivery, which I think they need to, and also plan to uh, close 12% of their retail locations. <clears throat> okay, um, one thing I, I've uh, covered quite a bit in the past is the local foods movement. Well, the thing I've been noticing this year is uh, local liquids. And um, we, uh, we do produce a lot of different beverages uh, here in Ohio. I, I just picked out a, a, a few uh, just to highlight. Uh, Snowville Creamery down in uh, southeast Ohio in Meigs County. Um, they, uh, they, they sell, uh, as they put it, uh, milk the way it used to be. It's pasteurized at low temperatures, non-homogenized, on the retail shelf within 48 hours. What impresses me is that, uh, the distribution that they've gotten. Uh, you can find it on the shelves at uh, Giant Eagle, Kroger, and a lot of the, the more high-end groceries. It's also a key ingredient in uh, one of my local favorites, Jenny's ice creams. Um, okay, um, we're we're uh, we're also seeing a, a, a real uh, boom in terms of um, microbreweries. Um, so some statistics here that uh, we've had 15 new uh, breweries open over the last two years across the state of Ohio. Uh, in terms of micro distilleries, we've gone from four to 13. And um, uh, our legislature is, uh, is in the process of uh, changing some of these laws that have uh, held back our industry uh, here in, in Ohio. Okay, moving on. Um, I think that this is really the, the big trend of the year, cross-channel shopping. Mobile technology bridges the gap between e-commerce and in-store retail. What you have happening is the same shopper, they might go online uh, to do some research, uh, the comparison shop, get coupons, make purchases. But, but they, they might, but, the, but they'll use a combination. They'll, they'll go online, they'll use mobile apps, they'll go to the store itself to do all these things. So does it count as e-commerce or a uh, in-store sale? I, I think someday we won't even talk about these as, as two separate categories. Um, web influence store sales are growing by about nine percent per year. Uh, that that includes uh, a, a, anything where people use the, the web to to do research or comparison shop. Um, that of course uh, adds some fuel to the uh, online uh, sales tax controversy. 
uh, a lot of people would like to see a national sales tax for online retailers. Online retailers say, well, we have to pay for shipping charges, so it's, it's still kind of an even playing field, but I, I think they're, think they're gonna lose that argument eventually. Uh, jobs creation, that's a little pun on uh, Steve, Job, Steve Jobs' name, but uh, Apple uh, is uh, probably the, the leading retailer in America right now. They, they do over $1,000 per square foot. And what I find interesting about Apple is it's kind of the offset model where you might go to the store to try out all the different options. And you might not buy the device, the iPod or iPad at the store itself. Uh, you might uh, go home and order it. And again, does that count as in-store sale or is e-commerce? E uh, Thirty-five percent of Americans uh, now own a smartphone. It's even higher among the millennials. Uh, I'm not going to read all these things that retail apps can do, but I, I did read where uh, shoppers used retail apps three times as much this, during this past uh, holiday season as they did in 2010. So that is definitely a trend. You may have seen these uh, weird-looking uh, QR code scanning uh, these these uh, boxes or yeah these boxes. I guess that started in Japan, and um, you're going to start seeing a lot of these at, at supermarkets. Uh, it, it'll you know if you uh, click on on the um, the QR um, code, it, it'll give you more information, uh, including nutritional information for food. I think the thing that the, that's really going to make e-commerce take off is when everybody starts walking around with an iPad. Uh, right now it's only 11%, uh, but uh, 6 to 12-year-olds had it at the top of their Christmas list. Uh, one stat that I, I noticed was that uh, uh, that people with iPads uh, were twice as likely with as those with iPhones to make uh, purchases uh, using their device. So... That, that's that's really going to make e-commerce take off, and, and store employees are going to start carrying around iPads uh, to uh, help them with a, a number of different tasks. All right, th this um, this last one. Um, this kind of this idea kind of came to me when um, when back in uh, November or December uh, there there was a lot of uh, news about uh, Sears was uh, thinking about uh, moving. Uh, out of Chicago, uh, either to, to uh, Texas or uh, Columbus, Ohio. And I, I think that kind of surprised a lot of people that they, that they would be talking about Central Ohio. Well, I, I think that people that are in the retail industry, uh, that, that they, they, they know that Central Ohio has a lot of things to offer uh, retailers. And if you just look at the, the roster of people, that, you know, of retailers we already have here, Victoria's Secret, Express, Abercrombie and Fitch, of course, Limited it, it itself started here. Uh, those are a little bit more at the higher end, and we also have more at uh, the lower end as well, uh, with Big Clots, Wendy's, and White Castle. Um, a lot of people, when they think about retail, they think about stores, but there's a whole science, uh, a whole technology behind distribution and logistics. This it's really pretty amazing, and. Central Ohio is, is right at the leading edge of that with Ohio State and uh, Rickenbacker and, uh, and just our, our geography being right here in the center of the country makes this a, a, a major logistics hub. Um, we've also had a, a number of um, consulting companies uh, that have uh, started here in Columbus, uh, um, Fitch, Big Red Rooster, et cetera. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of people locally, don't really know much about these companies because uh, a lot of their work is outside of Ohio. Um, and you know, how did we get here? Well, we had some pioneers that put Columbus uh, on the map. Uh, Les Wexner, he basically reinvented mall retailing with the Lemda and Victoria's Secret, and they went out and reinvented the mall itself. Uh, if you've uh, been out to uh, Easton, it's uh, was recently uh, ranked as one of the top five malls in, in the entire world by uh, Shopping Center magazine. The Casto family, uh, three generations of Castos uh, right here in, in Columbus, have opened some of the first shopping centers. Um, uh, town Century, or excuse me, Town Country was opened in 1948. It's the first shopping center in America uh, to be open in the evenings and on Saturdays. First one with uh, illuminated signs. 
So they, they were real pioneers. Um, uh, a fellow in my industry, Alton Duty, he, he, he started two of, I, I think, what are the two of the greatest uh, think tanks ever with uh, Management Horizons in the 1960s. Uh, Alton and, and a group of about five or six Ohio State professors got together and, and um, started this company because they were getting so much consulting work uh, out, outside of their, uh, outside their, their teaching. So they uh, set up a company to handle that, and it kind of became kind of the granddaddy of all these other consultants. I used to work at Retail Planning Associates, and it, its focus was a little bit more on uh, store design. Um, so I, I think that we have a, have a tremendous legacy here. And moving forward, um, the millennials are the most entrepreneurial generation yet. Uh, half of them want to be their own bosses. I, I think it might be a little bit out of naivety, but uh, you can actually uh, take classes in entre entrepreneurship um, in colleges now, and I, I think that's encouraging a lot of people. Here locally, we have uh, the Ohio State and uh, CCAD introducing hundreds of grads each year into the labor pool. Uh, when I worked at Retail Planning Associates, about half our staff was from CCAD, that's uh, Columbus um, College of Art and Design. And uh, again, you know, retailing is a lot more than just working in stores. There's a lot of different careers that uh, don't involve uh, standing on your feet for eight hours at a time. So I, I, I do think that you know more more uh, qualified people are interested in getting into retailing than in the past, and um, I think from the, the local government perspective that there's more interest in you know the big buzzword right now is economic gardening. Uh, why not try to help the, the companies that we already have here, since 80% of, uh, of uh, growth uh, occurs in small businesses, as opposed to going out there and hunting for these big companies where you you have to give away you know, um, lots and lots of taxes. In fact, um, uh, Sears did retain, uh, excuse me, Illinois retained Sears, but they had to give them $216 million in, in tax incentives uh, to keep them there. So I think that local governments are starting to figure out that maybe it's a better investment to, to work with the people that you already have. Anyway, um, that, that's all I have. Um, I'm uh, ready for questions right now. Thank you, Chris. That was a great presentation today. Um, and we're going to start taking questions now. Um, if any of you have to leave uh, for lunch or to go back to work, um, please send your questions to us, and uh, we'll be putting up the recording of the webinar soon so you can hear the answer to your question soon. Um, and we're going to take a short little commercial break here uh, while we wait for your questions to come in here. Um, to start off, um, at Heritage Ohio, as Ohio's official Historic Preservation and Main Street organization, Heritage Ohio fosters economic development and sustainability through preservation of historic buildings, revitalization of downtown and neighborhood commercial districts, and promotion of cultural tourism. So if you've enjoyed today's webinar, please visit our website at www.heritageohio.org and think about becoming a member of Heritage Ohio today. So we have some questions coming in here, and we'll start reading them just in a second as we'll get the window opened up. Um, first off, uh, Shirley has a question for you. Uh, do you have any projections in Northeast or Rain County? Uh, no, I, I'm afraid I don't uh, specifically. Um, I, um, I didn't do any work in Northeast Ohio over the past year, so I, I haven't really... Uh, haven't had uh, any uh, need to uh, study that this past year. Sorry about that. And Shirley has a second question. Uh, she also wants to know, do you have any projections for specialty retailers this coming year? Well, you know, that's, that's a pretty broad question. I, I guess it, it, it depends on uh, which uh, specialty you're talking about. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of classify specialty retailers uh, well, there, there's five categories of retail, um, convenience goods and services, home goods, fashion goods, leisure goods, and dining and entertainment. I think most of your specialty retailers would follow probably into home goods, fashion goods, and leisure goods. Um, I think, you know, home goods have uh, struggled um, ever since uh, we, we went into the housing crisis. 
and until the housing market looks a little bit better, I, I think that uh, home goods are still, you know, broadly speaking, uh, face an uphill battle. Uh, fashion uh, has had also some tough years. Part of the, uh, the problem with uh, fashion is that um, uh, many fashion retailers are fighting deflation because they manufacture everything overseas. Um, th their prices are, are dropping so low that, like, say, uh, um, take a retailer like the Lemdit, you know, if, if they sold, you know, 200,000 green sweaters last year, uh, this year they had to sell 220,000 green sweaters to, to get the same dollar amount. Um, and then, the, then the, the third category would be uh, leisure goods, and um, I'm I'm pretty bullish about most of those categories. These, these are um, retailers that relate more to lifestyles, things like uh, consumer electronics, uh, toys, sporting goods, uh, pets, um, books. Which I'm not too bullish on on that that category. The whole category of uh, of entertainment, like uh, you know, books and CDs. But uh, for the most part, I, I think leisure goods categories uh, should do well this year. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Mary has a question on how can we lobby the Ohio Department of Development to give incentives to small towns and smaller businesses instead of throwing good money away on companies like Sears? Yeah, well, that, that's that's a question that's kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, and, you know, that, that's, you know, uh, part of the reason that uh, Heritage Ohio and uh, my partner, uh, Deb, uh, and I started uh, Retail as Detail because we um, we do want to help the smaller retailers and I, I think you know if we have can uh, show some uh, success with that program that we will be able to get them maybe to, to uh, put more money in, into programs like that rather than like you say you know uh, you know doling out the uh, cor corporate uh, welfare to people like uh, Sears but um, I, I think it's going to take an effort on everybody's part to to, uh, to uh, do that lobbying Thanks, Chris. Uh, and we have a question from Jason. Uh, Jason uh, is asking, um, do you believe that the proposed Jerome Village development in Union County will alter the retail landscape of Central Ohio? And if so, how? You know, that, that's a really interesting question. I, um, I actually did a market study uh, for that development maybe two or three years ago. So uh, it is something I've looked at. And um, I, I definitely think that there is going to be some retail associated with the Jerome Village um, development. I, I, I guess the wild card is um, I, I could see that as being a, a, a potential site for a major lifestyle center. Uh, maybe not to quite the degree of Easton, but um, something like that. Uh, I, I just think that, you know, the Tuttle Crossing is, is, is well, you know, it's just kind of a plain vanilla mall, and I, I think that uh, that it, someone could kind of usurp it, its uh, position on, on the uh, northwest side of, of Columbus. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we're going to uh, pause for a second if anyone has any last-minute questions. And if not, uh, thank you, Chris, again for doing this today. Uh, it was a great benefit to everyone, including our main streets. And uh, if you have any uh inquiries uh, you can always send them to Chris and you can follow him on Facebook and visit his website as well yeah please follow us on on Facebook I'm my grovel <laughs> <laughs> well I don't see any more questions coming in so thank you everyone for attending today our next webinar will be on March 14th about green buildings and historic buildings thank you